She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she ran away. She chose hell over a life of polygamy. That girl was me. I was lost, alone, desolate. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me. In his love, I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. This is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we talk about Mormon polygamy and the doctrines of Mormon polygamists on this show. Uh, with today's show, we are going to begin a series on the equality of male and female in God's original design, which God has never changed. But first, for <clears throat> information about how a shield and refuge can help you or someone you know get out of polygamy, and have a safe place to go, you can go to our website, uh, shieldandrefuge.org, or you can call toll-free 877-425-9993, and all information will be held in confidence. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, or if you have questions or comments, you can email us at email at whatloveisthis.tv, or call 385-240-2888. And now to get on with our program for this show, I would like to introduce our guest co-host, or standing co-host, Earl Erskine. I'm standing. I'm sitting. <laughs> You're sitting, co -host. Nice to be back. It's, Thank you. It's nice to, to tackle this, yeah, this topic together. Yeah, this is a fun, together fun topic. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, throughout human history, <clears throat> women have had, and they do have a very difficult time, they have been considered a second class, as mere commodity to be used for men's convenience and discarded or enslaved by the male-dominated cultures. Historically, it really has been a man's world. Women have been subjugated and humiliated. They've been slaves of men who cared very little about the women's needs or their feelings or about her emotions or her sufferings. Men have used women for their own sexual fulfillment, for domestic duties, and primarily to give birth and to care for his children. In some cultures, there's little difference today than it was in ancient times. And this harsh treatment of women through the ages, however, was not God's plan. Sin and selfishness have corrupted the original relationship of equality and love that God established for man and woman. And in our culture of Mormon-based polygamy, it is religious doctrine that empowers men to exert oppressive authority over women. Mormon patriarchy rules. Women are to submit to the male authority with fear and trembling if necessary. They use unauthorized priesthood authority that in reality isn't from God because it doesn't exist from God. They insist their priesthood authority is for men only. The, all the women are under that authority and are required to bow in humble and unquestioned submission to it. In Mormon Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, the law of the priesthood is explained as being the new and everlasting covenant, which is polygamy. We want to quote verses 61 and 62. And again, as pertaining to the law of the priesthood, if any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another and the first give her consent, and if, if he espoused the second, and they are virgins, and have vowed to no other man, then he is justified. He cannot commit adultery, for they are given unto him. For he cannot commit adultery with that that belongeth unto him and to no one else. And if he have ten virgins given unto him by this law, he cannot commit adultery, for they belong to him, and they are given unto him, therefore he is justified." Ten virgins. Oh, yes. Now, this passion clearly advocates that even encourages adultery for the male. They have taught and they believe that after Eve ate the fruit, God cursed the female gender and women continue under that curse 
to this day. To illustrate, we want to quote from an 1857 article in the Mormon-owned Deseret News. Apostle Orson Hyde in 1857 addressed his audience as brethren and sisters rather than ladies and gentlemen because, he said, the order of heaven places man in the front rank, hence he is first to be addressed. Women <laughs> follows under the protection of his counsels and the superior strength of his arm. Her desire should be unto her husband and he should rule over her. Now, there's a lot we could say about Not this very comment, politically but, correct. <laughs> but we're only going to mention a couple of things. And he said men are ranked first, and yeah. he says that's the way it is. And how does he know how it is in heaven is what I'd like to know. But he says men are ranked first, and so therefore women should be ranked first. Now, that's pure Mormon thinking, and, yeah. and of course it's hogwash yeah. too. Yeah. Um, Eliza Snow was a high-ranking LDS female. She was a plural wife of Joseph Smith and also a plural wife of Brigham Young. She sold her soul twice to polygamy as her savior rather than Jesus alone. More Mormon historian Todd Compton writes that Eliza Snow was a Mormon spokesperson in support of male hierarchy. We have a quote from one of her talks to the Relief Society that we can easily see where she diminishes the value of females. Mm. The right to holy honorable wedlock was the right of all women, not just a few. By this means alone could women be redeemed, and since plural marriage was the only system in which all women could have the opportunity to marry righteous men, these men who stepped forward as volunteers to take plural wives were laboring in the cause of woman's redemption rather than ignore or deny the biblical curse upon womankind. Now, there's a lot in this that we <laughs> yes, could pull out as being wrong, but we're only going to pick on a couple of the things here. Notice that she said that women's redemption... Yeah. After the biblical curse on them could only be plural marriage. I know. This is blasphemy. It sure is. Absolute blasphemy. Jesus is the Redeemer and the only Redeemer. Mormonism's attitude towards women has always been that women are under God's curse, therefore are not equal to men or with men. We were taught growing up in the polygamy group that women had to submit to plural marriage because yeah. uh, we were under God's curse. <laughs> and that living Jeez. polygamy taught us how to become more Christ-like by submission to male authority without complaint, asking no questions, and refusing to be led by jealousy, unhappiness, or bitterness in our plural marriage relationships. Now, it isn't just Mormonism's doctrines that holds on to the false idea that God cursed females. Through the ages, the majority of the world's cultures have treated females as second class or worse as servants and sex slaves to male dominance. So in our focus of bringing biblical truths to polygamous, this is the first of a series of uh, the biblical equality of male and female as the Bible presents it. And we do hope this information will help plural wives, will help women in polygamy escape from the curse of polygamy and know that God never cursed the woman but created her absolutely equal with the man. Now, there are some very tough passages to cover in this series. And so we dig deep into the, the definitions of word meanings in the original biblical language to get at the truth. And much of my own research in this study, besides the Bible, has been material produced by Carrie A. Miles. She's the executive director of Empower International Ministries, an organization that teaches this information to male-dominated families in third world countries. And as a result, uncountable women and families have been freed from generational bondage of subservience, even slavery, to male authority. And I recommend that those who are interested in this topic to get her study guide entitled New Man, New Woman, New Life. The website uh, also has some great information. I think he put that up on the screen as well. It's empowerinternational.org. Another great book that I used on this topic is entitled Maelstrom, and it's written by Carolyn Custis James. It also is a very good book. If you're interested in this topic, I suggest that you also buy that book. Pro-polygamist websites have posted all kinds of <laughs> nonsense about women's unequal status with men, and we want to quote from one of these websites. Why are godly men allowed to have two or more spouses and women allowed only one? 
The answer to this question dates back to God's curse on men and women from the Garden of Eden, that the man should rule over the woman, for the woman committing the transgression was deceived. This is from alamoministries.com. He also went on to say, after the fall, God makes it extremely clear that the woman is not equal to the man anymore, but is under subjection to her one and only husband. She is to be totally dominated and ruled. And he write, writes further, because of God's curse on the woman from the days of Eden, <clears throat> her husband may be called by God to be a polygamist if he be holy. Thus the woman's desire would be for her husband to be exclusively her own, thus the fulfillment of the curse. We're going to have to take some time to use these passages and <laughs> yeah. go through everything that's wrong with that's them. Right. But we don't have time on this particular show because these statements are so wrong. But they're from a polygamous man who refuses to believe in equal partnership in marriage. Every conclusion he expressed is dead wrong. He is only justifying and exalting his polygamy. First of all, God did not curse Eve. We're going to begin at the beginning, which is in Genesis chapter, chapter one. one. Of course, the word Genesis means beginning. We're going to read verses 26, 28, and 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So there's nothing... I didn't see a curse in there. <laughs> right. Nothing in this creation account that indicates that man is superior over women at yeah, all. Yeah. Both male and female were equally, equally created in God's image. Both male and female were equally given dominion over the rest of creation, but not dominion over one another. Both male and female were equally blessed by God and encouraged to have children. God pronounced his creation very good. That included the female equally with the male. God's standard for gender equality is determined by him alone, not by any culture. In, uh, in fact, it, his will should be the standard of, of how to, uh, do, so. to bring cultures and shaping cultures about. And notice that the text does not say that God commanded they must have children so that the woman will fulfill her role as a female. A woman's value is not determined by how many children she has. In Genesis chapter 2, more details are given of God's creative work and we read the following. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from him made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, Now this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So we're going to bring <laughs> out some, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. And we're going to bring out some of this that, that they have used against the woman. Yeah. Uh, and a big problem, of course, is how they read verse 18, where it says, I will make and help meet for him. Now, contemporary word definitions have undergone drastic changes since the King James Bible was published. The phrase that God will give Adam a help meet for him is probably among the most misunderstood phrases in the King James Bible. Now, the Old Testament original language is Hebrew. The Hebrew words here for help meet for him is on the screen. It's Ezer Konegdal. To understand what the Bible is teaching, we need to understand the original word definitions as God gave them. A Hebrew biblical dictionary is important for this. Now, easier connect out does not mean gopher helper or servant helper. It doesn't mean subordinate or doormat 
or housemaid or baby maker or any <laughs> other word that someone might come up with. It doesn't mean any of those. Assuming that it could mean anything like any of those definitions would place the female as being inferior and subordinate to the man. And that's not how God created us females. We will learn that from chapter one. We want to quote from Carrie Miles' book. A helper sounds like someone we might employ to do dull tasks that we don't want to do ourselves, like wash dishes or dig holes. There is a word in Hebrew for such a housemaid, but this is not the word used by God to describe what the man needed. Okay. How interesting. It is interesting. God said he would give Adam an ezer konegdal. The Hebrew word ezer means to help or aid someone else. That word, Ezer, is in the Old Testament 21 times, and 19 times that it is used, it refers to help which comes from someone who is superior. In fact, in the majority of its uses, it is referring to help that God himself gives. We have an example. In Psalms 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And that word help yeah. is the word Ezer. It's the same word that God used to describe what the female would be to the male. Someone completely equal to the task because she was made perfectly equal with him to hold that position. And just for illustration purposes, here's a couple more verses that use the word Ezer, the same word that describes Adam's help. These are both from Psalms 33 and 70. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. And these are all the help that they're asking from God. Notice again that God's help, God's easer, is requested the same kind of help, the same kind of easer that God created for Adam. Mm. If God made Eve to be the same kind of help that he himself is to us, how can she be considered <laughs> inferior no. or beneath Adam? The female was created as this kind of helper, equal to the male. When God made the female, it was in absolute equality. There's nothing demeaning or inadequate in God's plan for Eve's relationship with Adam. Now, the second part of the phrase, the sentence is, I will make him and help meet for him. Ezer is the word for help, and the word for meet for him is the word connectow in the Hebrew. It's the English word for the phrase, yeah. meet for him, which is only one word in the, in the Hebrew. Now, the Hebrew dictionary defines konegdao as face-to-face -face or on level with. God meant for the female to be face-to-face -face or on the same level equal with the male. She would be like the man in every way except gender. This means that a woman is on the same level with all men, she can look him in the eye, which even today, some cultures Don't forbid her to do. Him. They force the female to walk behind him and sometimes with her head down. She's not allowed to walk beside him or to look into his face as an equal or even to speak unless he gives her permission. Now, this Hebrew word, connect out, tells us that when God created Eve from Adam's side, he intended her to be like Adam equal to Adam in every respect, face to face, on his level, as his equal. So, woman is made to be a help like the man, rather than a helpmate or helper for the man. There's a huge difference in the two positions. Yep. God made man from the dirt, but he made female from the man. He took part of the man from him and created an equal partner who was like him to be with him. When a man demeans a woman, he is demeaning himself because she is part of him. She was created equal in the beginning, and God never, ever disqualified her from that position, nor did he demote her or curse her from that position. And yes, woman has been demoted, but men did that. God didn't. Genesis 1.24 tells us this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. 
Okay, now yeah. that's a, an interesting <laughs> verse. About this verse, we want to quote from the book I mentioned earlier entitled Maelstrom. This is not just a romantic statement about marriage that gets repeated in wedding ceremonies in our Western culture. Within the patriarchal world where a man's wife becomes family property, this one sentence in the Bible violates patriarchal tradition and dismantles it. She writes a very yes, good book about these does. things. So it is the man who leaves his home, who is supposed to leave his home, and his parents and takes his wife away and they start their own family unit. The husband owes allegiance to his wife now, not to his parents, not to his family name, not to his family. And many cultures today would be shocked yes. at this. Yeah. The two shall become one. There's no room in this language. No matter how you twist it, you cannot twist it um, according to the original language that you can have multiple spouses. Three cannot be one. Fifteen cannot be one. There's no hint, no shadow, no mandate for polygamy, just monogamy. And we're going to get in the New Testament in about part three of this series. But even Jesus, when he was here, yeah. validated the two Should shall be one. Be one. That's right. Now, most of the problems about the curse of the woman comes in chapter three after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. Right. Now, God knew what they did after they ate the fruit, and he pronounced judgment on them. But he did not curse either the male or the female. In chapter 3, verse 14, God cursed the serpent. In chapter 3, verse 17, God cursed the ground. But you will never find that God applied the word cursed to Adam or, or to Eve. the woman, Eve. They disobeyed, and consequences of corruption and sin, of course, entered into their relationship with each other and with God. But part of that corruption is that women would become ruled over and overruled by men. This isn't something God decreed, it's something He said would happen as a result. So let's read Genesis 3.16. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and the, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay, now, a lot of the early Mormons use that last I'm sentence sure at big time in what they do, and we'll be using some of those in, in future shows as well. Now, there are some people in polygamy who claim that women are required to experience pain in childbirth because of this verse. They refuse the woman pain relief because they believe the female is sidestepping oh God's curse if they have it. Yeah. And of course, that's nothing but <laughs> cruelty and idiocy. But whenever we can relieve the pain of someone else, we should. Yeah. And besides that, God gave us brains and technology and medicine to use for our own good and for pain relief as part of it. Wow. And Jesus, he relieved the pain yeah. of many he when sure he were here. Miracles. So why shouldn't we when we can? Genesis 3.16 is a complicated passage, and we're going to discuss it next time in part two. We're, we're going to discuss it in full in part two, because there's several points in that passage yeah. that we need to talk about to show how it is not demeaning women and cursing women. If we look into the language and look into uh, application and context as God meant it to be. So we'll discuss that in part two. But we do want polygamists to know, especially polygamous women, that God does not show favoritism. Romans 2.11 yeah, and Ephesians. And Ephesians, for God does not show favoritism and there is no favoritism with him. Okay, so that's pretty clear, isn't yes. it? <laughs> yeah. well, and and, and no you know, that was... Female. That was one of the things that Susan Schmidt, um, she wrote a book, uh, His right. Favorite Wife, and she talked about that in her book, why she was in such misery in her polygamous marriage. And she asked, a, she asked God, why do you love your, your sons more than you love your daughters? That, it's so that sad. That must, must happen a lot in polygamy, oh. doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. they always have the the right to to uh, to rule and to have mm -hmm. the priesthood and everything else. Yeah, all they? that authority, all that fake authority that they claim <laughs> they have, uh, and 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 like she said, um, or or one of the polygamous wives said, why does the husband every night he gets to go to a home and have warmth and love and 
a good yeah. meal and because they know he's being visit he's visiting them and stuff. He, he yeah. gets it every night. So he gets it. How often does she get it from him? He gets it every night from his bear. And and it's like Cody Depends Brown. How many he said he's got. love should be um, multiplied. <laughs> you know, and so he's got what four or five wives, and so he multiplies. He gets the multiplication. Get, they get they divided. They get divided. That's yeah, true. Exactly right. And of course, people say, "Well, polygamy is in the Bible." Yes, polygamy is in the Bible, and so is despotism and patriarchy. But that does not indicate God ever decreed it as cultures have developed it. So we are out of time for part one as we present the biblical case that females were created equal with males and God never cursed them to be under the authority of patriarchy or male dominance. And in part two, we're going to finish the passage in Genesis 3 and then talk about some great uh, <laughs> examples of gender equality in the biblical record. Now, for, for the last half minute or so, how would you have accepted this as a, when you were a Mormon male if bishop? If I heard this? If you heard this. Oh, I'd probably dismiss the whole thing. I mean, I, I just figured God's worked it out. It, polygamy is his law. It's what God has a wife and many wives probably. And mm. I would have just accepted it. So, I mean, just, so is God's it's wife... that mindset that we don't understand. Um, is God's wife equal to him? No, I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I'm sure he treats her with... I mean, our assumption is he treats her with respect. In fact... To the to the extent that he wouldn't even tell us her name, because we thought his name was Elohim, but we don't even know the wife's his any of his wives' names are heavenly mother. Yeah. So we can't dis uh, dis, uh, dis disparage her name. Uh -huh. yeah. Is kind of the thinking there. So the, he had that much respect for her, but in reality, uh, we didn't. I mean, I would we would all assume I'm sure that God has. Is ruling he has the preeminence, her. and sure, he's and sure. he has, uh, and yet God created us in His image, and He created male and female equal. Yeah. And I never really picked on that uh, that He didn't really curse the woman. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, kind of it isn't there, yeah. you know, and 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 interesting. It's a good study. It's really a good yeah. study. Looking at the original words is very important, and how they're sure. used in the original language. We'll be doing more of that in the next uh, few lessons. So I want to thank you for helping again. Sure. We'll be doing yeah. part two next time. You know, we were created for a personal relationship with our Creator. We were also created for an equal relationship with each other. God has repeatedly expressed His loving heart of all human beings that He loves us unconditionally and He loves us each equally. God cannot love you more tomorrow than He loves you right now, nor does He love you more today than He did yesterday. His love is constant and focuses on redemption. Jesus said he did not come into the world to condemn us, but to save us through his sacrifice on the cross. <clears throat> but only those who want him can be redeemed. Jesus is the only redeemer of both male and female. No man can redeem any woman and the gospel of polygamists can redeem no one. Thank you for watching. See you next time.